Right, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the NECC fifth annual Clean Tech Financial Innovation Summit. I'm Alastair Pym, VP of Innovation and Partnerships here at NECC, and I'm gonna be emceeing the event. Um, very glad you could join us today. Uh, it's the second part of our Financial Innovation Summit. Uh, we had uh, one panel yesterday, all about equity investment in startups, which was uh, very good to hear so much activity going on post pandemic. And we're looking forward to a great panel today, which is going to focus more on the project finance side. Um, so thank you all for keeping your video and audio off for the moment. Part of the real value of this event is uh, the networking that comes with it. And we're sorry not to be present in New York, at BNP, as, as we've been the last couple of years. Um, but we want to keep you safe. Um, so that's why we're all on, on uh, a virtual platform. But the breakouts will give us uh, an opportunity to meet uh, some of you uh, in small groups. Um, what I'd like to do quickly is just uh, uh, explain one more thing about housekeeping. You're doing very well on keeping video and audio off. But for the breakouts, I would like you to go to the uh, participants uh, section of the control bar, which you get if you scroll up or down on your screen and rename yourself, look for the, the, the key link which says rename, put in your last name, sorry, your first name, last name, and the company name. And that way we get a good mix of people in each breakout. Uh, so it's, it, we find that very valuable to have a mix of uh, clean tech and finance people. And that way we get a good discussion. So please do that to help us. And that'll, uh, you'll see the value of that later. So the objective of these events has always been to convene leaders from both sides of this, from finance, clean tech, and the public sector across the Northeast. And actually beyond that now, we've got people coming in from Europe, from the West Coast, uh, and we welcome their participation. It's all about learning lessons and best practices, looking at the barriers and challenges as they change each year, and identifying new ways that we can all combine with public and private sector finance to help scale up the deployment of clean energy. So uh, as we go through this, please think about how you can share, how you can exchange, and what you can learn and take away so that we can speed this all up. We've got a great agenda today. Uh, in a moment, I'll hand over to Peter Rothstein, the president of NECC, who has um, both Alicia Barton, CEO of NYSERDA, and Jeff Eckel, CEO of Hannon Armstrong, in a quick chat. And then we have a panel uh, really digging into the details of how we can combine uh, not just risk capital, but also insurance. So um, that'll be a good one. Then we get to the breakouts. And finally, I'd encourage you to stay all the way to the end because we have a wrap up, not just with our president, Peter, but also with Alfred Griffin, who's the president of the New York Green Bank. And he's here to share uh, an update, but also some new programs they're launching uh, shortly. So please stay for the full time. Now, some of you may not know us too well, so I just want to take a minute to explain who we are. Uh, the Northeast Clean Energy Council is a business association nonprofit uh, based in Boston, with people in New York as well, covering the six states of New England and New York. And we're all about building a world-class clean energy hub in the Northeast, making it the best place to start and grow a clean tech startup, but also convening all the stakeholders in the ecosystem. You can see that map on the right with all the entities we do come across and bring to our meetings. Part of that is having a great strategic partner network and you can see the logos down below uh, with three utilities, uh, four or five large global energy companies and probably one of the biggest uh, investors in cleantech breakthrough energy ventures. They're the team that helps us think about these events, uh, help us understand the trends, recommend speakers and help us plan these events. So thank you for their support. And I'd also like to say a big thank you to NYSERDA who's a sponsor for this event. Uh, we have Alicia representing uh, NYSERDA today, but without your support, we couldn't uh, uh, do what we do with supporting innovation and putting on events like this. Uh, New York's been a massive leader in the last few years and a lot of that is down to uh, Alicia and her work with the governor. Uh, really exciting to see the goals that have been set and we continue to thank you for all the great work you've done supporting innovation and growing uh, this clean energy industry. So with that, I would like to hand over to Peter Rothstein who will take us away with the fireside chat. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Alistair, and good morning to everyone, everybody. Great to have folks here 
Uh, we're looking forward to all of this. Um, and I'm going to jump us right into uh, this, the fireside chat. Uh, so let me take a moment and introduce our, the, the two panelists who are going to be joining me in this. And as I do so, uh, please uh, turn your, 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 your audio and your video back on, Alicia and Jeff. Um, so uh, to kick this off on, our, on, on this chat, um, Alicia Barton is going to be joining us, the president and CEO of Nysterda. Great to have you here, Alicia. Um, Alicia's been in this role, I think the, the three year anniversary, I think is this weekend. Um, and as the other part of this, these uh, important dates, uh, Alicia, Alicia is in her next to last day at Nysterda with us uh, today. Uh, so we'll, we'll ask her a little bit la later about the transition that she's going through, but we're focused today on what NYSERDA does and what Alicia has been doing, what, um, what the role of NYSERDA and the private sector as well uh, in growing uh, clean energies and especially around deployment and scale up. Um, Alicia's background, in, in case folks don't know, is, in addition to having led NYSERDA over these last three years, she has a background in the clean energy industry, having been uh, part of the clean tech practice co-chair at, at Foley HOAG for a number of years, uh, played roles at uh, Sun Edison, both in utility scale wind and solar projects, uh, and was previously CEO of the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, a counterpart to NYSERDA in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, uh, and has had other public sector roles as well, and at one point was a board member at NECEC. So great relationship uh, and great to have you here, Alicia. And equally nice. great, uh, Jeff, wonderful to have you here. Jeff Eckel is the um, chairman, president, and CEO of Hand and Armstrong, um, a leader in the, the private capital and, and investing uh, deployment side of the clean energy space and sustainability. He's been the president and CEO since 2000, uh, was also senior vice president for some years earlier, uh, is a member of a number of boards of directors and, and advisory boards, including the Alliance to Save Energy, the President's Council at Ceres, the, the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center's Corporate Leaders Program, and on the Board of Trustees of the Nature Conservancy of Maryland, and the Board of Directors of the Maryland Clean Energy Center. So both public and private uh, collaboration and, and roles. So Jeff, great to have you here as well today. Nice to be here. Thank you. Great. Well, let us, uh, let's kick this off. Actually, if, if, if there was something I missed in the introduction there about a, a key point of either, either of your backgrounds or the role of your companies, um, and just start there for a sec. Jeff, anything, anything else we should know about Hand and Armstrong that I haven't positioned? Well, I think the, uh, the title of this is about financial innovation. And in many respects, mm -hmm. um, Hand and Armstrong is in itself a financial innovation as the first public company exclusively focused on climate change solutions investing. Uh, we were a 40 year old firm that went public seven years ago because in large part, we look at decarbonization as a finance problem. There are great companies like Schneider and NG who will um, come up with the technical solutions, but ultimately those technical solutions only get adopted at scale uh, and rapidly with aerodynamic financing. And we've been able to do that um, since uh, we created the first um, securitization vehicle for small energy efficiency projects 20 years ago called the, uh, the Hanny May. In effect, Hannah Armstrong going public and accessing uh, uh, the cheapest capital in the world is a way to allow us to aggregate small transactions, break the project finance model, which is one off, one off, one off, reduce transaction costs and get capital into these assets mm -hmm. uh, much faster at scale. Great, okay, thanks. Alicia, anything you want to add about the, the mission of NYSERDA? Well, I think you, um, uh, hopefully many, many folks on the phone actually know NYSERDA well. Um, I see a lot of, uh, not the faces obviously, but uh, names of a lot of old friends. It's great to be with you all and, and uh, great to partner with NECEC on this type of conversation, which is, um, you know, critically important as we continue to, to try to do exactly what Jeff just said, uh, which is scale uh, as quickly as possible. I think People are probably aware New York has put in place, you know, the arguably the most aggressive climate and clean energy targets um, in the country or the world. 
Mm -hmm. And we need a lot of help in order to be able to, uh, you know, find the right strategies to hit those targets quickly. And we're doing a lot in that regard, but there's, there's still a lot ahead. So, um, you know, very eager to participate in the conversation and, and just want to um, acknowledge some of the members of my team that are participating in the event today. And we're, we're eager to connect with, uh, you know, all the outstanding companies and, and entrepreneurs that are participating. Great. Well, let's jump in right, right on what both of you um, took us to, which is, which is about, in, in some ways, about scale up, but also about some of the, the strong goals and targets uh, here in the Northeast and particularly in New York, uh, New York State's Climate Leadership Community Protection Act um, has set some very aggressive goals and it'd be great to understand what those goals mean in terms of the kind of scale up requirement that New York is envisioning and that the industry needs to respond to. So Alicia, you want to share a little bit of that? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we've, we've really tried hard to paint as clear a picture as we can, knowing that that's, um, that uh, being clear about our strategies and our targets sends the type of investment signal that will attract people to come partner with us and, and attract people to invest in New York. Um, and really what we envision is, you know, let's just say over the next 10 years, um, a substantial transformation in our electric sector. We have a target of 70% renewable energy by 2030, and we're at about, um, you know, 26 to 28% today, depending on um, uh, the year and some of the hydro project, uh, production in a given year. Um, so that's a pretty, pretty rapid scale up, but we've actually drawn a pretty clear roadmap, including um, recently NYSERDA and our colleagues at the Department of Public Service filed um, a white paper that really lays out this strategy and it involves a scale up of distributed solar uh, and uh, an extraordinary scale up of large scale renewable energy, both land based as well as offshore wind. And I won't, I won't spend a lot of time on the numbers and targets, but we We've been very clear about a predictable schedule from here to 2030 for procurements for those technologies. Uh, we've uh, recently extended the runway for our New York Sun program so that there's you know, predictability and distributed solar. We've put in place um, significant incentives, um, over $400 million to support uh, battery storage installation that will help with grid flexibility and integration of renewables over that scale up. And we need the electric sector to really lead the way so that we can continue to push our decarbonization strategies economy-wide, which is what our law requires um, in terms of decarbonizing and electrifying buildings and transportation. Um, we are, uh, you know, piloting and launching a number of, of initiatives in those areas as well. And, um, you know, again, we're, we are... Um, we have a lot ahead of us, but we're not, we're not really waiting to get started. And I think that's kind of the, the big picture message we try to send is, you know, we, we want to uh, innovate now, we want to deploy now, um, and we're putting resources behind that. Um, and, you know, this hasn't really been done before. <laughs> there is not a, a, you know, an off the shelf playbook for decarbonizing uh, major global economies over a relatively short time period, we're talking 10, 20, 30 years. Um, but, you know, with, if we harness, you know, the collective um, appetite for innovation and investment of the, you know, the types of models you're talking about today, you know, we're, 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 we're optimistic that we can, we can take a good run at it. That's great. Thanks. And, and Jeff, uh, so picking up on that from a, a similar vein, you know, for the kind of type of financing and projects you do uh, and where you see some of the, the most important uh, urgent opportunities in the in the next handful of years. Where does policy fit in for you? What what are, where what are the things that you look for states to to put in place, whether it's targets or financing models or public private structures that would enable you to play a role for Hand and Armstrong to play a role in, in accelerating this deployment effort. Um, one short story uh, that will uh, illustrate my perspective on the role of public and private. Uh, intersections. In 1989, I financed a, a solar project at Hannah Armstrong, uh, and it was the last one done for about 20 years because there was a thing called the energy tax credit that went away. Mike Hannon came to me when that tax credit went away and said, looks like your business just died. So I learned from that painful example with two little kids and being, having no job that um, uh, relying on government policy, particularly federal policy, 
for a stable business is hazardous. Um, that said, I've had um, a terrific respect for NYSERDA since I got my master's in energy policy at Syracuse a long, long time ago and learned a lot from NYSERDA. And what I see nationally is the states are by far the most effective policy uh, makers and the aspirations in New York are, are really uh, uh, challenging California's reputation as uh, uh, a leader. So congrats to uh, NYSERDA and to Alfred and the Green Bank. It's been a, a terrific evolution of New York State energy policy. Um, and I look at the energy policy as supportive um, and uh, uh, like a tailwind. It's not necessary. The private sector is making rapid decarbonization investments, but we're doing it against a headwind of the Trump administration and, and some hostile states, particularly in the South, that you know we're just not going to get there fast enough unless we align private investment with public policy. So I applaud um, NC, uh, uh, the, the whole Northeast uh, uh, states for their leadership on this. We invest more than a billion dollars a year in clean energy. And, and what we really focus on is the efficiency with which our capital is used to decarbonize. We use a thing called carbon count, a very fairly uh, conceptually simple metric of the amount of greenhouse gas emissions are re reduced by one of our investments divided by the amount of capital. The concept is if carbon counts and capital is scarce and both of those are true and we need to go so much faster than we are as financial providers, we need to do the most impactful investments uh, we can. So it's our, our true north in uh, uh, climate change solutions investing that has been very helpful. But to, to get specifically to your question, the things that New York State are, and, and California and other states are doing are setting an aspiration that is uh, inspiring. And uh, it's the only way we're ever going to get there is to uh, to have these kinds of uh, 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 big aspirations. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and, and Alicia, I think one of the other ways in which New York State creates its aspiration and creates some of the models, I think is leading by example types of efforts or efforts that look at state facilities, uh, facilities like the SUNY campuses, about 64 of them, I believe, across the state of New York. Uh, partners like NIPA, who you who you work with, and in doing leading edge projects, it, are, are you, do you want to touch on any examples there or in other parts of of, of where of uh, areas where where New York State is a partner in the facility side and able to show leadership projects? Sure. Yeah, and I I do think one of the things that is unique about uh, New York, at least in in my experience um, over the years in in this industry and nationally, is is the number of different um, uh, tools we have in the toolbox, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So we have obviously an agency like NYSERDA that provides um, a number of of policies and long term contracts for investment in in clean energy solutions. But we do have the New York Power Authority, which is a, uh, the largest public utility in the country, and they invest heavily in innovation and and are pushing the envelope and and rising as we all are to meet meet the high bar that the governor set for for everyone in New York. Um, the SUNY system, the same. The New York Green Bank. We just there's a number of insert institutions that all. Are working in concert, but but kind of coming to the to the conversation with different different tools and assets available. And we definitely focus on trying to create replicable models uh, through leading by example. Um, and SUNY is a great example of that. You know, we we have been partnering with them um, on a on a number of specific projects. Uh, particularly, you know, we 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 work with them um, to look at things like, uh, you know, is it possible to do uh, you know, totally transformative retrofits of, of dorm facilities um, to reach actually a net zero um, type of standard. That's something we have seen, you know, achieved in Europe, but not widely deployed uh, in the United States. And, and so we, you know, we, we've been working with SUNY and other partners on, on those types of approaches for a long time. Um, one thing that happened recently as well, a number of other higher, higher education institutions in New York came together uh, for a collective RFP for 
renewable energy and again send that you know that kind of that that buying signal and that was a i think a pretty cool and unique effort to see those institutions pooling their uh their capital together and really trying to spur investment directly you know in the state for local renewable energy projects which of course is what their um many of their students and and partners are are asking them to to take a hard look at so um, you know, it's, it's, we don't have enough time to talk about all of those, but what I, what I, you know, would, would invite folks to do is to, you know, to, to let us know, um, you know, what else we could be doing. We're, we're very eager to understand new approaches, um, whether it's technology or um, in some cases, you know, a really interesting integration of technology with a financial innovation or, um, or a um, you know a new customer arrangement that uh, that that we think you know holds a promising model. We're 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 eager to 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 you know find the best ideas and make them work here, and then and then again scale them up and and keep going from there. And Alicia, building on the on the uh, uh, the SUNY story, um, while it's outside of New York, New England. Um, we announced uh, in Q1 a partnership with NG at the University of Iowa for a billion dollar retrofit of the electric uh, water, wastewater, stormwater uh, uh, utilities on campus and two, two campuses. Billion dollar transaction. It's going to retire a coal plant. It's going to reform uh, the way they buy energy, the way they use energy. And so what I've commented on several times, it's the aspiration of the energy service companies like NG, uh, uh, like Amoresco, the capabilities of these companies, uh, Schneider, my goodness, uh, the capabilities of these companies is getting so much more uh, powerful than uh, because of the technology, but also the growth of the need. You need to combine, combine um, uh, supply side solutions with demand side solutions. And in my 40 year career, those two never talked. But you have somebody like uh, uh, NG or, or Schneider who is able to, to do those kinds of things. That's actually what customers want. They don't want somebody to just change lighting and to go have a renewable RFP. Take care of the problem. Help us achieve our decarbonization goal. This is incredibly complex stuff uh, uh, and it has to be done carefully and thoughtfully. But the offerings that we're seeing now nationally and globally even uh, to, uh, to address the, the entire carbon story of a campus situation is uh, uh, inspiring. It's a great example, and Jeff, that, and clearly that goes beyond just energy. You're talking about water and other resources and, and, and providing fin both finance, but the, the operations of those, of those assets as well. Is that right? Well, yes, it, it is. And, um, the primary focus is energy, but I think University of Iowa's entire utility staff was 110 people. And they're running a coal plant, two Yenbacher gas engines, wastewater treatment plant. That's, that's really thin. So you bring a company like NG that built the Suez Canal uh, a century ago um, with tremendous capabilities. Uh, I think universities are seeing the old model of keeping it all in sourced is just not going to uh, have the capability and potency that uh, these these great companies are bringing to the table. Yeah. So I'm looking at the clock and realizing we're we're going to be winding down soon, but but I think I've got time for one more relatively brief answer question to to both of you. Um, one of the big areas as we talk about electrification and and reduction of carbon there, we also talk about electrification of major sectors like transportation and buildings. Uh, would love to hear an example or, or, or something that's a, that, that, is, that, that is foremost on your mind about what that vision of electrification of transportation or buildings looks like. Alicia, you want to go first? Sure, happy to. And um, we, uh, we have to get clarity on that vision um, and quickly if we're going to be able to hit, hit the targets. And I think, you know, one place that we are very excited about is, um, is really investing in, in electrifying buildings through scale up of, of heat pumps. Um, that's something, of course, that, uh, 
you know, has been talked about for a long time, um, but really needs to happen, needs to happen on a, a pace that's much faster than we've done before. And it's a really, um, it, it's a sort of a multifaceted problem. Um, you know, we, we see a need for technology innovation for the technology, which has gotten uh, much better over years, but to continue to improve and adapt to new building types, for example, to be able to be uh, inserted seamlessly retrofit into buildings that are on steam now, for example, and, and that have really inefficient steam bo boilers. Those, those types of conversions, um, the technology needs to adapt. We also need um, a different type of trained workforce to deliver these solutions. The, uh, the HVAC industry is um, highly dispersed, mostly made up of small companies, um, you know, less than 10 employees, and they are not familiar with this technology. And it is a, a, a massive challenge and opportunity to really retrain these people to focus on new technologies that, uh, and make sure that they are conversant in, in the benefits that they provide for consumers so that the consumers start to get educated um, about this by their, um, by, by their service providers and the contractors that are showing up to do work. We need uh, financing models and, and, and sales models as well. And there's a number of, of cool companies um, in New York and beyond that are really pioneering there, including, including Dandelion, who uh, uh, works on you know, home geothermal installations and um, uh, that NYSERDA has partnered closely with. And, and we see them working with Con Ed to do some really aggressive pilots. And in the Westchester County area is a direct result of gas constraints and the need to uh, inject clean alternatives as opposed to, to dirtier alternatives. So um, there's, uh, there, again, not enough time to kind of go through uh, everything we're doing on that front, but, um, you know, we're, we are uh, starting to run, run fast in that direction, but we're going to need a lot, of, a lot of innovation and new thinking to show up along the way, too. Yeah, great examples. Thanks. Jeff, do you want to piggyback on that? Uh, well, first, great an uh, answer, Alicia. I, you warm the cockles in my heart when you talk about heat pumps and um, really boring technology like that that is super impactful on carbon. But with respect to the different sectors you talked about, we are strong supporters of a carbon tax and dividend program. That's the only way we get to electric power, transport, ag, and get a carbon in all of its areas. Uh, we are certainly hopeful that um, uh, uh, our uh, federal government will, will do the right thing uh, in, the, uh, in the coming cycle. It is a fantastically impactful market-based solution that will unlock uh, capital. We're already starting to see the cost of capital of uh, fossil fuel companies go up, the cost of co capital of companies like us go down. When those start to expand, the race is on. Uh, we start to get to decarbonization and a price on carbon is essential. And then Jeff, add to that a little bit. What's the, is, are there one or two key areas of technology innovation that you're looking to see to, to unleash some of these efforts? It's really, uh, I spoke to about university, it's integra integration of all of these great technologies. It's when you know, we go from uh, an a la carte menu to a total solution. And you know, somebody like Schneider, what they're doing uh, in the built environment is just awesome. Uh, so I don't think it's any one thing. Storage is obviously a big game changer, but it's the integration of all of these things and the ambition and aspiration to do something truly uh, uh, whole building and whole, whole utility system that will uh, create the kind of change we need. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Well, I, I'm gonna wrap this up with uh, one other brief acknowledgement. Um, first of all, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Alicia. Uh, great conversation. I, I wish we had another hour, um, but we actually do have another hour of some very thoughtful follow-on thoughts from our next panel. So we're going to turn it to them in just a moment. But I, but I guess I wanted to come back to you, Alicia, one last time here, uh, as you're going to be wrapping up your tenure at NYSERDA uh, at the end of this week. Um, first of all, thank you from NECEC and, and all of our members and all of our folks, our friends who are here with us today um, and just want to ask you how you're feeling about this transition. Oh, <laughs> I, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's always bittersweet to, to, to step down from an extraordinary job like leading NYSERDA and leave a team that I, um, that, uh, I adore and that I believe are, are really the, the best team in the country doing, doing clean energy work today. 
Um, uh, and at the same time, I'm, I'm just completely confident in their ability to, to keep knocking it out of the park. And uh, I'm really excited to see what, um, what, what great heights they, they continue to achieve after I go. So I, I feel really, um, really great about what we've, what we've done over the last three years. And um, sky's the limit for here from New York. Everybody should absolutely keep watching what New York will do. Absolutely. Thanks, Alicia. And, and thank you also, Jeff and Hannah Armstrong. Great to have your involvement and your, your efforts in, in such a great leadership way as well. Peter and Alistair, thank you for the opportunity. All the best, Alicia. Thanks. And Alistair, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Thank you, Alicia. Thanks, Jeff. And with that, I would like to uh, welcome up uh, our next panelist, if they could turn on their videos and audio. And I think we're, yeah. Uh, there's, okay, um, so you heard from Jeff and Alicia talking about um, some of the opportunities there, especially sort of new business models, new technology. Um, and we've got a great panel that I'm very pleased to welcome, uh, who's actually doing some of this stuff. Um, so uh, with that, I'd like to uh, well, we'll, we'll introduce the, by name at least uh, the panelists we've got. So starting with Ravina Advani, Managing Director of BNP Paribas, based in New York. We have Will Sibia, founder of Urban Systems over in Sweden. So bringing some uh, interesting new ideas from Europe. Uh, David Suarez, president and CEO of Lexton Capital in New York. And finally, George Thomas, co-founder and partner of New Urbana Ventures. So uh, I'd like to start uh, the panel just by asking each of you in turn to just uh, say a few more words about who you are, who you work for, and where you fit into this puddle. So let's start with Ravina. Thank you. Terrific. Terrific. Thanks, Alistair. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Ravina Advani, and I head up BNP Paribas Energy, Natural Resources, and Renewables Coverage Teams, where I'm responsible for our sector activity broadly across the energy, um, the energy world. And within our, as part of our focus in energy, we cover power and utilities, metals and mining, oil and gas, and commodities. A big part of my role also entails advancing the bank's sustainable finance efforts um, really across the, U the, the U.S. renewables franchise, but also more broadly. Um, sustainable, sustainability has really been at the heart and the core of everything that BNP Paribas does. We've been implementing policies for sectors with high ESG risks. We have been retreating from companies that have fracking as part of their DNA. We've been entering into rec trades with various utilities as part of, as part of our own energy procurement strategy. We've been deploying massive amounts of capital to the renewables industry. And we've also been innovating on the financial product side where we've been at the forefront of sustainable linked loans and green bonds for our clients broadly across various industries. A huge part of our endeavors, as I mentioned, does relate to growing our renewables practice um, globally, but certainly in the US. We've been incredibly active supporting developers, sponsors, infrastructure funds, Funds, oil and gas companies and utilities really across the capital stack with their financing needs. Our institution has a very strong risk culture in place and I know we'll touch on technology a little bit later, but we've really been at the forefront of financing more mainstream technologies, more proven technologies, onshore wind, solar both on the PV as well as distributed generation side, geothermal, hydro, district heating and cooling for example. Um, I'm very excited about the role that financial institutions will continue to play in the broader transition by reorienting some of that capital to more sustainable investments. And um, in terms of challenges, which I know we'll talk about later, um, I do agree with everything our previous panelists did mention just regarding administration and policy and adopting new technologies. That's great Thanks, stuff. Dan. Thank you, Ravina. Uh, can I call upon you next, David, please? <clears throat> Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you, uh, Alistair, for, for the invitation. Uh, Lexon Capital um, is primarily an investment uh, firm. We uh, invest in real estate and infrastructure projects, typically between 20 and $250 million in project size. We do tend to get involved in early stage and development phase. 
to help structure transactions properly, um, so that uh, so that the uh, companies and, and finance parties like uh, Ravinas will will uh, will uh, appreciate uh, the project a lot more. Um, and uh, we, uh, myself personally, I was I just stepped down as um, as uh, chair of the finance committee for Smart Cities Council, and I. Uh, uh, and past president of the Mortgage Bankers Association for New York City, uh, for New York, sorry. Um, so um, so I have a, we have a wide variety of experience in our shop um, between um, real estate, um, infrastructure, and we also have in-house engineering, which is quite rare um, for an investment firm. So we actually have someone that knows how things work rather than just how they fi get financed. So. That's great. Thank you. And uh, Will, if you could go next, please. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Alistair. So Urban Systems, what we try to do, we try to integrate the solutions, technologies, and the finance to deliver complete outcome or mission-oriented outcomes for the developers and real estate owners. So we, we are backed by the industry organization in Sweden, which is one of the largest urban tech portfolio globally with 4,200 companies. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to see which are the proven solutions, robust technologies that are in Nordic countries that can be scaled up and applied to different parts of the world. In US, we are specifically focusing on New York, especially after what you heard what Alicia man mentioned, you know, very aggressive and very ambitious plan for them to decarbonizing. We, we thought that's such a great regulatory driver for us to actually come to the market and introduce some of the technologies and solutions that Nordic countries have done over past years. Most of the Nordic countries have been able to decouple the carbon emissions to the GDP growth. And they've been successfully doing that since 1970s. And some of these solutions have been around for over decades now. And from our research and understanding of the New York market, uh, we are focusing at the moment on the building sector and trying to introduce the heat pump technology and our knowledge in the fifth generation just to heating and just to cooling technologies to especially address the problem to remove the gas from the building sector, electrify the building sector, whilst reducing the impact or or the stress on the grid. That's what we're doing now. Thank you. That's great. Well, I think some of those things must be music to the ears of, uh, of NYSOTA and New York. So we'll come back to that in a minute. And finally, George. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. My name is George Thomas. I wear two hats. Uh, the first is uh, I am a co-founder at a uh, venture studio primarily focused on co-innovation. Uh, we are based in Washington, D.C., and the primary purpose of our mission is to accelerate innovation in critical infrastructure. And that means the three pillars of where does the money come from, how does it get deployed uh, and put it to operations, and how do we foster innovations both from new ventures as well as enterprise uh, uh, efforts in, into the space. And clean tech is obviously one of the biggest pillars that we target. The second hat I wear is uh, in Washington, D.C., politically speaking, we are divided between between two states and the District of Columbia. So getting anything done into operations is significantly hard. So there was a regional collaborative that was set up in Washington DC called Connected DMV, uh, which is the brainchild of the 24 local governments in the region. And I serve as the Vice President of Innovation to get major efforts off the ground here in the metropolitan Washington area. Thank you, George, that's great. So as you can see, we've got a great panel which covers many different aspects of this challenge. Uh, I think it kind of starts uh, with, uh, you know, what New York is looking for and kind of some of the technology solutions that are coming across. So, Will, I just want to ask you the first uh, question, um, which is, uh, you've, you'll say you're bringing proven technology over to New York, right, and to the rest of America. And we heard um, uh, Ravina say, yeah, yeah, we should be able to finance proven technology. But is it that easy? Uh, now, what are the barriers for bringing technology from another country into New York? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very good question. And of course, when you come as an outsider to a market like New York, which is very, very well established, especially the construction sector, which is in some form quite conservative as well, it's not so easy. So in this case, we've got a very good 
uh, support from the developer which you're working with. They are developing a very large portfolio in Manhattan to be able to showcase what we can do. So one of the key challenges, what we found was the engineering industry in New York and how the risk mitigation and how the insurance works around them is not so progressive. So their professional indemnity is based on, and once it goes for claim, it essentially refers to peer review. So essentially everyone wants to do the same thing over and over again. So new technologies and new solutions become harder. One of the things that I'll underline is none of the technology which we are trying to bring in are essentially new. What we are trying to bring in is how we integrate these technologies to get the desired outcome. So we are bringing, in fact, a very simple traditional technology, but a different way of implementing that and integrating in the buildings uh, from the building level to multiple at campus level and also at a tenant floor level. Okay, that's great. Good to understand. So I want to ask David as a follow-up. Um, so I know, and I know you guys are working together a bit, but uh, so with that challenge in mind, how have you, uh, you know, what sort of options have you got to help Will uh, and his solutions enter into the market in New York? <clears throat> well, um, just, just, just to clarify, the, the, the issues we have um, on the finance side is that we, we need to finance something that has um, that we can underwrite the performance of. So uh, when you when you address when, when you install or or, or or produce new technologies, um, we need to be able to know. Okay, well, how does that perform, and how, how do we underwrite that for for, for debt and equity? Um, so stepping back to Will's uh, situation, the the design engineers and the and the contractors. Um, have to provide warranties ultimately to the to the developer as to how those those um, uh, every aspect of their of their production will perform. Um, so uh, what we've what we've done uh, we've been working on with Will and what we've 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 been able to do is provide uh, a warranty uh, based on the uh, we we underwrote we had an insurance underwriter underwrite the um, the past performance of the product. Um, and we're able to provide a warranty uh, with an investment grade or, or suitable credit backing um, that will enable uh, the developer to get financing. Uh, hopefully that's, uh, if it needs more clarification, please let me know. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that sort of starts it off, but in terms of how you pair that with other types of finance, I mean, I know there's, there's different financing vehicles, so that's one, one leg of the stool, if you like, but are there other legs of the stools that you can uh, couple up with that? Well, um, no, I mean, I, th I think the insurance warranty and the performance of the technology um, is um, is needed for all levels of capital stuff. Unless you're, unless you're looking at venture capital, which which we don't, we, yeah. an infrastructure we don't utilize, you know. So, uh, I, I mean, unless I'm missing something there, Alistair, am I missing something? Um, <laughs> Uh, well, I know we talked about pace financing as, as one uh, part, one one variant of the capital stack, right? So I don't know if you want to go there now or later on. But uh, well, we can go. We can go with, with pace now. I mean, uh, you know, uh, for for me, you know, um, you know, pace is is uh, um, you know, you know, property assessed uh, clean energy uh, program. It's it's and uh, C pace is for for the most part of what we're dealing with on this for this panel, which is commercial. Um, you know, it's it, to me, it's the ultimate P3 project uh, of financing. Um, it's it is it's uh, just to give you some some uh, outlines. It, it costs the government nothing. Um, it uh, provides uh, for low cost, long term financing uh, for at at a hundred percent to the uh, building owner. Um, it uh, uh, allows for um, for um, quick and easy underwriting, which is which is not typical in our finance arena, um, and uh, it 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 supports you know government um, ambitions for global mobilisation acts um, and 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 other and other uh, clean energy um, uh, goals. So um, it, it's to me it's the ultimate um, P3 financing. Um, if 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 there's a clean tech 
there'll be a lot of clean tech firms, I presume, listening, and, and, and a lot of finance people and contract people, uh, the contractors as well. Um, that you, you, this is a program, uh, just to give you some stats, just to give you an idea of how big this market is for us in the Northeast. Um, from uh, 2017, there was $600 million done uh, in, in PACE financing, uh, 850 million in 2018, and 1.5 billion in 2019. That's how sharp the curve is in terms of this catching on. But most of that has been on the West Coast, as, as probably most people that have looked into this know. But we're looking at on the East Coast now, between our GMA programs for, for DC, um, New York, uh, and Boston, I think, as, 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 as you probably fill in better than I would, Alistair, they're, they're about to adopt um, uh, a, a more rigorous program. I, th I think, um, but New York, for example, they, they, they think over the next five years, there'll be $4 billion of capital expenditure going into this market. So if anybody's looking to get into the, um, into the uh, New York market on the clean tech side, I'd highly you know, recommend that you, you learn about PACE and how it can be used uh, when you're making propositions to commercial uh, property owners. Uh, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a quick summary on that. If there's any, any further details, or certainly we, we're an advocate of it um, at Lexton. And, and we're right now working on a few programs where um, actually one with Will, um, potentially, um, where rather than, uh, it's usually financed you know, by banks, uh, local banks and or securitized um, securitization firms like Deutsche Bank or Starwood. Um, but those pricing to me is a little bit high. Um, and I think that we could, uh, I'm working on some solutions that could provide lower cost financing for place. Um, especially since we're, we're, we're getting into an area on the East Coast where there'll be some big numbers um, uh, financed. That's good. And that's a good segue actually to ask Ravina. Um, uh, particularly, I remember you, you talked about sustainable linked loans. So if you think of what you heard from Will and what you heard from David, so say you've got a new technology proven in Europe coming over to the US, you know, what, what, from what you've heard, would that make it more attractive to you or are there still barriers for you to jump into something like that? <clears throat> You know, as, as we look at the, the U.S. and we look at the, the, the world actually trying to meet the two degree scenario, I think that there is a lot of genuine excitement about new technologies. And when I look at financials and financial institutions at large, banks have varying degrees of how much risk they're able and willing to take. I look at BNP Paribas, for example, we definitely tend to be more on the conservative side. So it's not to say that we couldn't finance a new technology, but what we'll do is we will analyze the credit holistically. We will look at all of the risks that we are being asked to take, whether it's merchant risk, whether it's technology risk, whether it's sponsor risk, and we'll analyze the credits holistically. As it relates specifically to technology risk, I think it really depends. I mean, one could argue that, you know, we've been financing offshore wind and APAC and EMEA for the last several decades, but when you bring that technology to the US, we're excited about what's to come in New York, that is still relatively new and we just need to ensure that we're structuring around these risks. I know we've talked a little bit about insurance products as a huge mitigant. I think that that definitely also helps get a financing done. But it's, it's a long-winded way of saying it really depends on the type of risk that we're being asked to take, the type of technology. We'll look at the pilots. We'll look at how those pilots have been operating. Um, you know, we will roll up our sleeves and you know, do the, the diligence on the technical side. But it really just depends on the broader credit story that we're trying to sell internally as well as externally to the market. So uh, well mentioned heat pump. So have you... Uh, done any financing of heat pumps? Because we hear it a lot as one of the big solutions for transitioning away from, you know, the way buildings are heated in the Northeast, especially uh, where we want to be by electrifying it all. So have you done anything in that field? We have, we have. I mean, we, we did a district heating and cooling deal last year for one of our infrastructure fund clients that was looking that we were supporting them on an acquisition with. I think that that area is going to be a huge area of potential and growth for, uh, for banks and investors at large. Right, good to hear. All right. Alistair, if I could just jump in there. One, one aspect that, that uh, the audience should be aware of is that it's not just a question of financing the project uh, at, at, at inception. 
uh, it, it's all it's 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 quite a lot more about um, the managing of that asset and, and how and, and who's going to manage it and, and how we underwrite that uh, going forward. It's, so the technology may be warranted in terms of performance, but it's, it's the operating R and M part of the um, of the team that's that's quite critical to these technologies as well. Yeah, good point. And, and so that means, you know, you've got the time when the project is financed, you've got the time when it's operated, and you need to have, uh, think of that. But I also remember us talking about the time before. So when's the best time to bring in the full team uh, so that it's a successful uh, sort of uh, process all the way through and you don't get hurdles along the way? Well, I'm, I'm, if, if that question's for me, I mean, I, 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 I'm somewhat biased. I, I, I think that the finance uh, aspect of, 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 a, of a project should be addressed first um, because uh, you know, the finance aspect, from my perspective, when, I, when, I'm, when I'm dealing with, 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 with uh, early stage projects, I, I, I want to make sure the team uh, is, is aligned fully for financing. Uh, I want to make sure that the, the contracts, especially if they're P3 contracts, are are um, structured in the right way for financing and also to get give, provide long term benefit to the um, to the, the government uh, service um, and uh, and that um, uh, that you know, we we're, were working all as a team towards a long same long term goal um, and so there's, there's the aspects are you know the, the development team uh, the technology uh, the um, the finance team. Uh, and and also the O and M or the service provider. Those are the four key elements to me uh, to making a, a project. And I think they all need to get an, an, uh, involved from the from the from the outset. Um, it, there's not usually too much involvement, you know, from uh, a finance person um, or um, or uh, uh, the O and M at the in the early stages. But they still should have their input. Um, so uh, that, that, that answers your question. Yeah, that's helpful. And I think there may be a, a few other entities involved, depending on the project, but thinking specifically about sort of public private partnerships where you're dealing with a municipality or a county or a state. Um, and that's where I'd like to bring in George, because you're right in the middle of that, George, with your uh, the collaboration you're doing down in DC. Um, so I know you've got a, a recent history of doing that and sort of going back, pulling coalitions together, of sort of multi parties of different types and helping them collaborate uh, but also your IT experience and sort of helping with these new business models of XX as a service so talk to us about uh, how your the lessons you've learned in what you're doing can be applied to some of what you're hearing here and to accelerate deployment of clean uh, energy yeah uh, thank you Alistair yeah I mean uh, some of the things that we are uh, dealing with in clean tech in the United States there's lots of lessons learned from other industry verticals and other geographies that go through the same thing. So from a fundamental perspective, I have what, uh, what at New Urbana we call the triangle of hell, uh, which is essentially, you know, if you think of the three fulcrums, fulcrum one is who's got the money to spend on it. Fulcrum number two is where is the value being delivered to who's going to run and operate it. And fulcrum number three is basically the solutions, the technologies, the business models that come together. In many cases in clean tech, the funding and uh, the operator might potentially be a government or a public entity of some type. So therefore the value proposition that you have to present is joint. But in most cases, in many other industries, those are three separate fulcrums. So getting those three things together to work in any sustained fashion is tremendously difficult. And especially when the technology slash solution side of it is not bankable in financial terms, that it doesn't have 10 years of history, it is not easily explainable to a finance person who doesn't understand the tech. There are risks that are unknown because of any number of political, geopolitical, technology, business, operational. All of that comes together. It makes for that middle of that triangle to be very, very difficult to manage, especially to pull coalitions together. Uh, so I've worked in a number of countries, including having spent three years in China uh, running a government business for IBM. Uh, and part of the discovery is in every geography you go to, the triangle looks different. The value proposition you have to pull together is very different. What the financing community looks for is different. What technology can provide for is different. But there are a number of lessons learned from across the world, be it, as you indicated, uh, applications in data centers or in you know, X as a service, 
uh, or when cloud computing first came along in the IT space, or if you take that and put it into what's going on in engineering and construction on digital twins or building, you know, building information management systems. There are lots of lessons learned from every one of these industries on what has happened in them and what one can do. A good portion of you know, what we are trying to do here in metropolitan Washington with Connected DMV and why you know, New Havana is involved in that process has been to apply those lessons learned across the board to get multiple stakeholder communities to work together for a common purpose. And in the clean tech space, I believe a lot of the technologies are you know, proven even though as uh, Ravina mentioned, proven in other geographies, but they're still proven. We have 10 years plus data for many of these things. The only portions that are you know, unproven today are whether in the current geopolitical climate of the United States or Canada, what are the puts and takes that would make that risk manageable? What are the standards, the technology stacks, the operational uh, requirements, the policy standards that it has to hit to get the right staunches of money? And from a connected DMV perspective, our biggest part of our mission is what we call extending the public purse. So there's money that is set aside for these kind of initiatives by the US federal government, by state governments, but that is limited and constrained by a whole set of strings and budget constraints and you know, timing, et cetera. And there is money to be had from the private financing side, be it banks, private equity, even some venture capital. But trying to connect those two is difficult because traditionally they don't work as well together. So a good portion of our, uh, as you say, bringing that community together is working with the private finance and the public finance and trying to make them see eye to eye in what is possible, both with programs like PACE that David uh, mentioned, as well as new constructs that we are trying to set up. So here at Connected DMV, we are thinking about these programs individually and saying, okay, for a program to roll out uh, a grid enabled building construct here in the, in the Washington region. We have two large utilities. We have a whole bunch of microgrid operators. We have a bunch of campuses who are interested in clean tech and have motivations to do it. What are the structures we can put into place to make that work and how it works, for example, at Walter Reed Hospital would be completely different than how it works down at the innovation campus that Amazon is building. But there are enough piece parts to make those collaborations and coalitions happen. I think the challenge the challenge for uh, all of us in this space is having the openness to be looking at the existing pieces and saying, what can we pull together for New York City or Boston uh, that would work there and being open enough to kind of expand the traditional operating models uh, to collaborate. So it sounds like you've got to jump in and try it and you've got good models there. I want to ask you a follow-up question, which relates to what Jeff said, which uh, from Hannah Armstrong, which was, you know, there's some you know, energy as a surface is, is emerging as a model, and there are great companies like NG and Schneider, who are members of ours, who are doing that. Uh, but I know from working with them, and they would freely admit this, that um, they're not great at innovating new technologies. Their whole platform is based on open innovation and working with companies, uh, smaller companies who are more nimble. And when it gets to a certain point, they'll industrialize that and fold it into the, uh, the full solution. But so how do you look at that? What, what is your observations about innovation in the energy industry? And who are the companies who are really doing the interesting work now that could become part of this, uh, these sort of energy as a service uh, offers? Uh, that's a great question. So, you know, if you look at the pure data points between new venture innovation, just the startup community and the VC community, and innovation from within an enterprise, the numbers are not all that different in failure rates. They're pretty bad and they're pretty uniform. And then when you start comparing about why that happens between new ventures and enterprises, the reasons fundamentally are similar, but there are some particular structural ones. So when you become the size of an NG or a company like that, you do that by managing risk and therefore you have a lot of processes you put into place and gates you put into place, which then when you have to move fast work against the basic principles of why your company has been successful in the first place. So this is a very difficult catch 22 to get over. And there are many mechanisms that larger companies and I work for one for 16 years have tried to put into place, including outsourcing portions of it spinning out companies, you know, creating an entirely different cost structure for some. There are many ways people have tried to do it, but speed is essentially what comes and bites you in not being able to move fast enough or having what we call empire building efforts that happen because of human nature, 
when these things happen. So at New Urbana, we have been working with uh, companies in the enterprise space, trying to help bring the lessons learned from enterprise internal innovation and from new venture innovation and saying, there is a lot of sausage making that is involved in actually making the blocking and tackling for innovation to happen. That sausage making very often is not in the core DNA of an energy company or a construction company or a port operator, because that's not what they do. So take that sausage making, think of it as you know you would accounting or HR functions and put that sausage making on somebody else's plate and you focus on the domain expertise. I think we think that is a mechanism looking forward where we can take the best of multiple industries of light and clean tech and other energy spaces and make a little bit better progress in making bankable projects at lower risk. That's great, yeah. <clears throat> um, so how does that compare with what you see over in Sweden, Will, and how, how are you thinking about sort of uh, taking your technologies and thinking about the business model you're gonna apply over here in, in New York? <clears throat> Well, I mean, you know, when we work in infrastructure space, you know, urban, urban planning, buildings, applied technology compared to software, obviously there are multiple stakeholders involved at every, every level. So the problem is complex, I will not say, but I would underline that it is not as complicated as it seems to be or is normally made out to be. Because what we are trying to address here, if we really want to reduce the carbon emissions, if that's at the heart of it, then we'll have to think from the systems perspective. If you look at the systems that we're trying to change and we're trying to combat, these are legacies based from 19, you know, early 1900s, you know, after, after World War, pre-industrialization to post-industrialization. So if, if you say, let, let's make flying carbon neutral, and you say, well, let's retrofit a jumbo jet. That's a massive task. By the time you, you will you know, retrofit a jumbo jet with electric fans, it'll not happen. Whereas if you say, well, we have a new glider that probably needs a small motor that can be electrified, then you suddenly have an electric flight. It's not that it's, it, they'll do the same task, but what I'm saying is, if you have an ambition to decarbonize, the problem does not have to be so complicated. And I think in looking at these things, if I look at New York, where I've spent most of the time in the last two years, if you look at how the district energy system works in New York and how the waste works, New York produces millions of tons of waste every day. And there's millions of gigawatt hours of heat that is dumped into the river in New York with district energy system. So your waste and the waste to energy solutions are working throughout the world. There's nothing new technology in it. But of course, the problem is complex because of multiple stakeholders. But I think we need to find where things are getting entangled and getting problematic. One of the things that Nordic countries have successfully done is the integrators, the cities, municipalities have become integrators where they've been able to converge the investments, the space and the technology and started to create circular systems. So circular infrastructure that promotes downstream economy and reduces the resource use in the infrastructure, that's the key. So I think we need to look at the problem. We need to decarbonize the economy. The first thing we need to move is try to see where the waste is and try to look at the linear infrastructure that we've created. If we try to put renewable energy in the same grid that's been subsidized, made over from 1950s, that's like retrofitting battery packed, you know, turbo fans and jumbo jet, and that'll take years. Whereas if you start making small circular infrastructure, decentralized infrastructure inputs, starting from the building level, block level, district level, and then connecting it, then the, the renewable energy that is being installed will be so much more effective. The energy saved, the cost of energy saved is far more profitable than in deploying new energy, and especially in the current system. So I think that's what the Nordic countries have done successfully. So it sounds very exciting. Um, and I, I know you've done a bit uh, of work here already. So are you able to share anything uh, of the work you've done here to move the project along in terms of validating it, getting partners, uh, or is that still too early to, to share? No, I, uh, I can absolutely share. 
that we have actually, which we are focusing on for New York at the building level, especially because of the regulatory drive that Alicia mentioned as well. And she also mentioned heat pumps and together with the partners. And we were, we were lucky enough to have uh, one of the very large developers as Heinz who are really excited and supporting this effort uh, for us. So that's obviously good to have a strong partner in New York because we are quite new people here. So we are focusing on bringing the latest generation heat pump technology. And now, now heat pump technology has been there for 70 years. It's proven, it works in all types of climates. So we are saying, okay, what's the latest that's in the Nordics, how do we bring in? And the fifth generation of the heating and cooling system, where we are moving to high temperature cooling and low temperature heating, essentially that makes the systems a lot more effective and reduces the resource consumption at the upstream. And like Jeff was mentioning, you know, the connection between the supply side and demand side, and how do we reduce that gap? That's what we're trying to do. If we, are, if we only need the energy that's low grade energy, then you are significantly reducing the input at the production side. And that's the two basic elements that we're trying to do, come to New York with. And we're trying to do that at a at actually a floor level, building level, and hopefully doing that at a city block and a district level. That's great. Thank you, Will. Um, where, where, what I want to do shortly is to start asking the audience if they have any questions. We're going to ask you to uh, use the raise your hand function, which is part of the participants panel. So if you go into the participants section, down the bottom right hand corner, you can raise your hand and I'll pick people from that list and ask them to turn the video on and, uh, and ask a question. Uh, so let's just have one more round of questions, then we'll come back to that. So in the audience, please prepare your questions, raise your hand, uh, and I'll, uh, I'll keep it going till then. <clears throat> um, and I'm reminded that I should share the slide of how to do that. So just bear with me a second while I multitask. Uh, okay. Hold on. There we go. So while we're, while you're thinking of your questions, here's how to do it. Um, so um, hearing all of that from, uh, from Will, um, you know, it sounds like a bright future, but what else have we got to worry about? I want to throw that open to the panel. You know, what remaining barriers are there where uh, state government could help, where other policymakers could help, where other entities in the ecosystem could help make sure these dreams become reality? So who wants to, to take that question? <clears throat> I can take a stab at it. One of, the, one of the lessons learned from other industries, and I've been in this innovation space for about a couple of decades now, is sustainability of projects. There is a tremendous amount of money that's put to pilot or phase zero things to prove a point, and then not enough thought put to why that should remain, whether the ROI functions through the operating life cycle, who's responsible for the rest. And you know, every time a new kind of industry or a sub-industry has taken off, there are a lot of bodies left on the wayside because that's not been thought through. So I think looking at the full kind of sort of life cycle of clean tech, uh, to Will's point, whether or not it needs to, how it needs to integrate with the existing infrastructure, what the new world would look like. I think that has to be deliberate and there's a lot of lessons to learn we can apply in clean tech just based on what's happened in other industries. Great. I would also just add, Sorry, Alistair, I it's, it's Ruby. And I would also just add that, um, you know, I think that there are, there's a lot happening in terms of innovation regarding new and emerging technologies, evolving technologies, and coming at it from a financing perspective. I also think it's going to be critical to see how the industry, the financing industry innovates on the financial product side. And so, you know, we've been seeing an emergence of green bonds for the last decade and a half. We've been seeing, you know, the emergence of sustainable linked loans. The first one was done in 2017. I think that constant innovation is going to be really helpful in incentivizing future growth in the clean tech arena. We're already seeing massive growth because you're seeing not only some of the utilities that we mentioned, developers, but even some of the, the private equity and sponsor names raise massive amounts of capital to deploy towards clean tech. You know, maybe five, seven years ago when there wasn't that much pressure or excitement on ESG related investments that there wasn't, you know, there was a lot more growth in maybe call it the thermal generation space or maybe oil and gas or social accommodation and transportation. Now we're really seeing a shift where, 
you know, investors are definitely looking at tilting their portfolios towards stronger ESG frameworks. And as a result of that, we're seeing sponsors raise massive funds in clean tech, in climate related investments, in renewables. And I think that that will continue to spur activity. And I think the financing community does need to create products to incentivize future growth to make some of these newer technologies more, um, more amenable to, to banks, for example, that have been typically very risk adverse when it comes to new technologies, either given technology concerns or scale up concerns or just sizing concerns. So Ravina, you talk about innovation in, in the finance world. Um, where does that come from? I mean, I'm more familiar with the, the, the technology side and so startups really do a lot of the innovation then the big companies adopt it once they get disrupted. Is that the same in banking? Is it small companies who come out with these things first or are you guys dreaming up new ways to package offers up? You know, we're, we're, constantly, we're, we're constantly trying to innovate across all financial products. I mean, it's, it's, it's the easiest when we look at credit facilities, right? When you look at a, at a green bond, there the use of proceeds are basically being allocated to a clean project or a green project. Sustainable linked loans, these are corporate facilities that really help facilitate a company to achieve certain targets. And it doesn't necessarily only need to be environmental based. We're starting to see a huge emergence on some of the social and governance aspects, right? Health and safety of workers. That's been a huge focus given that we're all living in these, in this, during this pan, these pandemic times. So I think that the innovating is coming by and large from the financing industry as a whole. We're looking at derivative instruments now that are considered green, that provide incentives to clients to, um, to grow in a specific arena. Um, it is really happening, I would say, largely with the benefit of the financing community, certainly with regulators. Um, you know, we do a lot of work with the UN, for example. We're constantly exchanging notes as we look at broader standardization in the industry. But it's, it's largely coming from the financial players. That's great. All right. I do see one question out there. So I'm going to start this process of uh, audience questions. Um, so uh, Jeremy... Uh, I can see your hand raised. If you would like to turn on your video and audio and ask a question, and then we'll, if anyone else has any questions, please join the line. Thank you, Alistair, and, and thanks to the panelists. This is a, a great conversation. And one of the questions um, that came up to me is around Ravina's conversation around managing risk. And I, I wanna know, we, we hear from a lot of sort of developers, clean energy developers that the, the on the ground um, issues around building projects is getting more challenging in the Northeast. And I, I wanted to see if that is something that, that the finance and investment com community is seeing around projects um, in, in, our, in our neck of the woods. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, in, in New York and New England generally, right, I, I think it depends on the asset class first and foremost, you know, obviously, there are transmission challenges that, um, that we have to work around if we're talking about large scale projects. Um, you know, I would say it, it, like I said, it depends on the underlying asset class. All of that being said, if you look at the RPS standards in New York and the clean investment goals, that's constantly driving innovation. You're starting to see big coal assets start to retire that are gonna to need to be replaced to deal with some of that lost capacity. So the way we look at it, um, when we're talking about new innovation, when we look at any given project, we will work hand in glove with consultants. We'll obviously work with the developers, but we're working with independent consultants that can give us the best guidance to deal with permitting issues. Are there rights of way issues? Are there transmission issues? Um, that, that we do hand in glove with a lot of the technical experts. But to answer your question directly, I do think it really depends on the asset class that we're talking about. I brought up offshore wind. You know, that is going to be a huge area of growth in New England, 20 gigawatts. New York has um, many players like Equinor. They've been awarded leases. And that's a big question, right? What are the NIMBY issues inherent to offshore wind? What are the Jones Act issues inherent to offshore wind? How surmountable are these? So um, again, dependent on the asset class. That's helpful. Other folks have, have a perspective on that? Just to, just to note, and I'd like to add that there's, a, there's the other side of this as well, uh, that, that is the technology uh, change 
that's that's both been inherent in our in our business in the last um, 10 years 15 years and will will be uh, inherent in our business over the next 10 to 15 years as well so it you you, you are going to come across not just um, uh, I, I guess some sort of slowness in terms of approvals, as as, as Ravina had mentioned, but also you're going you, you're going to have to address how your technology is going to adapt going forward. If we if if people like Alistair and Ravina and myself are going to finance a project, typically infrastructure projects are financed over the long term. So to do that, we need we need to make sure that we can underwrite those that technology over the long term. Which, to be quite frank, I don't think anyone on this on this on the panel will say that we actually can. So, so the issue is, how do, we, how do we adapt going forward? How do we address changing technology going forward? So those um, vendors, uh, technology providers and contractors uh, and service providers, o &M, they, they need to, to be on, on board as the team uh, addressing those issues up front because, because uh, I think that's, it's, it's, uh, I wanna make sure since that, that I, I overemphasize that point, I did it slightly earlier, but I wanna make sure that um, uh, the service providers out there, they really understand that this is a long-term partnership that they're getting into. It's not just a, here's a product, I'll see you later. That is, right. That's not the case. And if I can add one flavor to that from a public sector perspective, a couple of years back, uh, I was part of a task force by the previous governor of Virginia, Governor McAuliffe, on electrification of transportation. Uh, and the key question he posed to the task force was, I have, you know, $100 in budget. And I know what I can spend money on. I don't have any more money to spend than I have. And I know what gives the best bang for the buck for my population. The single biggest bang for the buck is primary school education. So if you're asking me to spend $2 out of that $100 on electrifying my highways, that has to have a higher ROI than primary school education. Can you, as a task force, go off and look at this and come back and tell me that's worth doing and that will have an ROI? And electric, trans, you know, electric vehicles are really going to be the thing. And it's not going to be fuel cells or hydrogen or some unnamed technology in 15 years. And obviously, there is no answer to that. But these are kind of the things that, from a policy perspective, public sector really grapples with. That's a different flavor of financing and risk that one is looking at. Thank you. Seems like Alistair needs to take himself off mute while I put myself on mute. Yeah, good point. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, thanks for kicking off the audience question uh, session there. I do see another question out there from Ryan Mitchellup from Eva Technologies. I think you're from Canada, right, Ryan? So if you could uh, pull up your video. There we go. Good to see you again. Yes. Um, so I'm with uh, Ever Technologies and Ever has a, uh, a challenge in that our technology is a really a whole new infrastructure class of asset. We have a closed loop geothermal technology and uh, we've proven that at near commercial scale and we're starting to work on our first commercial project. Uh, that project is going to be in Germany because of the high feed-in tariff uh, that they have uh, for electricity in Germany or in the Netherlands for heat as well. But my challenge is that we're looking at an infrastructure class asset yet we are a technology company. So there's sort of the two opposite spectrums of the capital stack. We've got the high risk, high return technology investor, the BC investor, and we're, we're building an asset that, um, you know, our project in Germany is 200 million euros for the first phase going to up to 2 billion euros uh, as the second and third phase happen. It is staggered capital deployment, but the challenge is how do you get third party investment capital to come into uh, an as yet you know, unproven infrastructure technology. This is a multi-generational asset. Um, this will run for uh, 30 years for sure. Um, but you know, really when you discount stuff beyond that, it doesn't matter, but really we're talking a hundred year asset life. So I'm trying to identify the types of capital providers that would be willing to invest in um, invest in a long-term multi-generational infrastructure asset, but with a technology that doesn't have a track record of that period of time. So that's my question. So who would like to take that? Maybe that's a question for David uh, to start and maybe Rabina afterwards. <clears throat> um, 
So I'll, I'll, take, the, I'll take, take the first time with that. I think, um, as I sort of alluded to in, in, in the general session, that it, it, it behooves um, companies like yourself to, act, to try and structure the transaction um, more towards capital needs. Uh, what do I mean by that? I, I would, you know, endeavour to get um, those um, uh, uh, parties that provide certain elements of your of, of your physical product to provide warranties. Um, it, I, I, you know, from, from my understanding, geothermal is fairly straightforward to understand. It's financeable, um, but someone has to to warranty the physical product to make sure it's going to be there. Um, someone studies have to be done to make sure that the uh, geothermal variant is, is I, I believe that's the right terminology, is 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 um, is present. Um, and I, you know, I I I don't depending on the size of the project, I, I don't see and other than structuring the the contract with the, and I've seen some weird contracts come out of Germany. So so so. Um, uh, they tend to be a bit loosey goosey with their contracts. We, in the in the US and, and, and other parts of Europe, they tend to be a bit firmer. But, but um, I don't know if Ravina wants to speak about that. But but um, we um, but I, I think that uh, uh, you, we just need you need to make sure your contracts are, are someone needs to make sure your contracts are financeable, technology is right. Um, I, in, to answer your question, I would say um, there are you know family offices uh, that might take um, uh, a uh, a part risk. Um, there are, um, there are, um, and there are infrastructure funds that could be a little bit more aggressive on the equity side. But what you're proposing is probably more equity based um, and uh, than, than debt based. If, if there are a lot of variants in the in the in the actual performance model, I don't know if that answers your question clear enough. But we can talk about it offline, uh, Ryan. If, if you like, but I'm, I'm very familiar with this type of structuring. When you're dealing with large projects, you need to layer the capital stack. So this is a finance term, I, I know, but, but you, know, and you layer that according to risk. So there'll be more risky capital. They may all be, to you, it may all look like one piece of debt or it may look like one piece of equity on, on top of debt. But there may be different layers of, of, of risk within that of different investors. So it's not that simple. Uh, I don't, without talking, seeing actual details of, of your model, I, it was hard for me to say how I would structure it. But um, just uh, from an evaluation standpoint, um, you need to uh, you, you need to back up your product as best you can with the, with the, with your suppliers uh, in terms of performance. You need to back up your contract as, as to make sure that's financeable, and and and, and you need to uh, and, and I think it, you need a finance expert or an investment bank that's that's good at layering that stack. And I, I would just add, um, you know, Ryan, you, you, you said a lot. I first and foremost would agree with your commentary that we're starting to see greater convergence between the energy sector and the technology sectors. There's a fair amount of overlap. We're starting to see, you know, renewable assets combined with data centers. So interesting point that, that you bring up. Um, you know, in terms of helping see your project forward, I also think it would be helpful to engage an independent consultant early on, because what, what we typically do when we get involved in call it early development projects, um, you know, we're, we're, we're bankers, I'm on the financing side, I would lean heavily on those technical experts, yes, to ensure the resource adequacy of the project, but also to opine on the technical aspects, to go through all of the underlying operating assumptions, to, to ensure that the project itself is going to be viable. And so my advice would be to really find a renowned technical consultant to work alongside you to help produce a bankability study for the benefit of the investment community. And that would be a really good way to, to, to jumpstart your process. I would also say that you know, on, the, on, the, on the capital side and sourcing the right capital, there's an abundance of capital and liquidity out there chasing transactions like this. Um, you know, we, we work, uh, and not, this isn't a sales at our commercial, but, you know, we, we oftentimes will get involved for, you know, development projects like this and help find investors to invest depending on where the project is in the life cycle. A lot of it will also depend on the size of the transaction that we're talking about. I mean, if it's a $500 million project, you know, maybe there's a, there's five different investors we could go to. If it's a lot smaller scale, that could certainly 
um, change who we would approach on uh, on a placement like this. But um, long-winded way of saying, I think that there is an abundance of capital out there, but without knowing the details of the project, it's hard to give you proper guidance. But for starters, I would definitely try to bring on board an independent engineer. I would, I would add um, two, two points of, to note um, as well. Uh, uh, Ryan, what, number one, and Europe is a lot more aggressive um, and more flexible with their investment uh, criteria typically than we are. Um, they're much much more experienced at P3 structures um, and, and how to um, get those closed. That's number one. Number two, you could also consider um, your import export bank as a backer, um, which, which since these projects are quite large, um, you can, uh, they, they can provide typically um, uh, typically up to 80% financing um, so, or credit guarantees for up to 80% financing uh, for, uh, with, 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 a, with a, in your case, I guess, would be Canadian, um, you know, uh, government backing. There's that's, that's a couple of solutions there for you, but, and then you'd, you'd marry that with some funds. Um, if you have the financing, if you qualify for the financing in place, it's going to be much easier to go out there to get the equity. Um, it, it, it's one, one, you have to lead with one of them. <laughs> Uh, it usually helps, but uh, those couple of different things. That's Thank great. You. Thank you, Ryan. Great question. Hopefully, you got some good advice there. Uh, we're coming to the end of this panel, so what I would like to ask all the panelists now is just to wrap up with sort of last advice uh, to everyone. Anything you want to share, and maybe as we talked in the in the warm up, uh, you know how this. I don't want to ask you for too long. So either you talk about wrap up uh, sort of question and advice or talk about the impacts of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic on, uh, on the world of project finance. But just a quick minute from each of you before we uh, go to the breakouts. Thank you. And maybe we'll start with uh, Will because we haven't heard from you for a while. <clears throat> um, we, I mean, I think we mentioned, I mentioned a little bit just before in our introduction section, I think the EU Green Deal will help us a lot, especially in Europe, to move away from the COVID crisis towards more of a green, clean economy. And we're really looking forward to, to that. And we will continue working with our partners in New York, to try to establish ourselves in New York. Thank you. Great. We look forward to helping you out here. Uh, George? <clears throat> um, I just wanted to leave a historical thought. Uh, innovation is iterative and it is circular. So if you looked at where electricity started, when uh, it was put up by Edison, when he established his first substation in Brooklyn in New York, everybody till that point had their own microgrids in their backyards. That's how they powered it. So when he set up the first substation and piped power to everybody, it was looked at as radical and completely innovative. We have just come full circle with microgrids and clean tech now. It's just the world is circular and iterative. Just remember that. <laughs> Time to watch that movie about Tesla and uh... And Edison, I think, and refresh our memories. But yeah, good point. Um, okay, Ravina. <clears throat> I would just, just to address your COVID, um, your COVID question, I'm really encouraged by the fact that transactions are now getting done. Our institution, we closed $2 billion, um, $2 billion transactions, one for a uh, geothermal transaction and the other for the acquisition. We were helping support Carlisle and EIG with their acquisition of two thermal assets from Panda. I think that that's really telling that there is a market, there is demand, uh, there is paper out there for, for well-structured and quality transactions. And second point is really excited about, you know, a lot of the U.S.'s focus around decarbonization, which is going to continue to spur growth and activity in our market. Thank you, Ravina. And David, final word? <clears throat> Very quickly, um, I spent 30 years um, investing and lending in the real estate sector. And I'm, in the last 10 years, I'm now involved in a sector where my kids are actually proud of me. So, I will, I will say that this is a very, very exciting field. Um, and I've, never seen a, I've never seen a field like it in the last 35 years. Um, and uh, I, 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 I could be of any help to anyone um, listening, please, please feel free to reach out to me and, and, and uh, uh, God bless everyone. This is, this, is, this is something we can do to actually make a difference. Great, well, thank you very much, uh, panelists. This has been a great discussion. I hope you'll stay with us for the breakouts. Um, so keep your videos on. I'm going to just uh, share my screen and ask everyone else to start putting on. Uh, we're going to jump to breakouts. Hold on. So um, 
what Zoom will do is assign you all to uh, breakout groups. Um, and we're going to spend the next 25, 30 minutes talking about one question in each group. Uh, the facilitator will explain the uh, instructions and get you all to introduce yourselves, because this is all about networking. Uh, take 15 minutes to discuss that. Then the facilitator, with the help of the group, uh, will decide on how you're going to respond to that with a few main bullet answers. Uh, and then we'll come back for a report back, all the groups reporting back to the full group, summarizing the discussion. So that'll all take 45 minutes. But And don't forget, we've got Alfred Griffin and Peter doing a wrap-up at the end of that, so hearing from the New York Green Bank. So um, uh, these are the questions. Uh, what barriers exist in financing in, and in, or ensuring uh, clean tech infrastructure projects? That's question one. Number two, as the economy picks up steam over the coming months coming out of this uh, COVID-19 related recession, what type of federal stimulus, maybe that could be state stimulus as well, for clean energy scale up and infrastructure would be most valuable? And finally, what best practices can we bring from around the world or across the US to the Northeast to help us accelerate deployment of uh, innovative clean tech. So threads we've heard before, but that's what you're gonna be talking about now. And just quickly flashing up uh, the facilitators in each group, Peter Rostin, you've seen before, Jeremy asked a question, you, uh, Pat Sappensley from Urban Future Lab, Rob Parker from SIF Capital, uh, Cassandra from SIF Capital as well, Stacey Weismuller from uh, Second Muse, and I think I'm uh, let off this one. So. Enjoy the breakouts. Uh, Kate, if you could uh, put us into the groups now, and then we'll come back in just under half an hour. Thank you. All the rooms and you guys will get a notification to join the room, so please just do so and you'll be sent there automatically. Enjoy. Um, so great conversation. We were talking about the third question. Um, we jumped around a little bit on others too, but um, so this question is, what's be what best practices can we bring from around the world and across the U.S. to the Northeast to help accelerate the deployment of innovative clean tech? Um, we talked about it in a couple different ways. Um, there were some suggestions about, uh, especially with early stage technologies that may be a bit of its, of a, of its own category, that um, Regula regulations can be barriers to those technologies if the regulations uh, assume a specific technology as opposed to being more technology neutral and assuming that you may have a broader definition of the performance outcomes that could potentially be met by new technologies or new integration or configuration of systems. Um, so that was a request and I think a call for, for, for more technology neutral uh, regulations to enable uh, technology, new innovations to prove out their value proposition. Um, we also talked about some of the difficulties of finding the right kind of go-to-market partner, whether that was a utility or a large integrator um, and combinations of integrator and finance. Uh, so being able to identify networks uh, and, and connections of those types. Um, and we did talk very briefly, I mentioned that uh, NECEC and our uh, navigate effort and investor corporate customer connect we do have um, a limited but growing network of early adoption customers and early adoption strategic partners who we look to make connections to for startups which and that's all in the the intention of trying to help develop accelerate the development of new of best practices around new solutions uh, we talked about some barriers to financing especially um, I think barriers to financing for um, for technology that may may have had some pilots but hasn't had full scale demonstrations and is going through its first of a kind uh, situation. So being able to identify networks and practices that can support that uh, was called out. Um, that's something we can come back to in a moment when uh, Alfred and I are, are chatting about the New York Green Bank. Uh, and I did say on our side for NECEC, um, one of the things that we have in our own internal roadmap is looking to, to try to help create a network uh, for sharing best practices, for creating and sharing best practices. So universities who can do case studies of, pro of early projects, uh, engineering and consulting firms who could do uh, the testing and validation of performance of, of early systems deployment things of that type that would make it a lot easier for that to move to move beyond the early project risk 
stage for project scale up and for the and for the the creation of global markets around new solutions. That's so great. I'll stop yeah. and leave it there. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Jeremy, let's move to your do you want me to share your meeting notes? Does that help? <clears throat> Please, I think that is helpful. Um, I, we had a very good conversation around barriers and and um, it was it was a, a a well curated group because we had a a, a banker um, a an entrepreneur and a strategic you know large corporate and each had a, a very good perspective on it we talked a lot about technology barriers um, and you know the need for track records and ways in which to prove out a technology when you're making a, a, a a big investment in it's both on the the hardware side um, and on the software side and, and I think that oftentimes we we, do, we don't uh, acknowledge the the, um, the the technology technological complexity around software solutions and um, that that was a, a big piece and so that's that's number one number two is around offtake and knowing that there's going to be a, a, a continued market for uh, the, the the energy that these these um, uh, investments are being uh, made for and things like feed-in tariffs and long-term contracts um, for for offtake can help alleviate that sort of market risk and market barrier. Uh, the third piece was sort of the contracting of, around various. Um, parties uh, with respect to who bears what portion of the risks among the various contractors that are building uh, an offshore wind installation, for example, and, and how, you, um, how you assign that risk and, and, and manage it there is, a, is another barrier. And then the, the last sort of big bucket of barriers we talked about is the, the absence of a favorable regulatory environment. Um, and Ravina really noted that, that a lot of the, the um, technology development has been uh, helped by federal tax policy uh, and the uncertainty around where that is going um, is is a, another barrier to be reckoned with um, I think the the other the other sort of piece we had a little bit of a conversation about is the, around the emerging of, of, of innovative insurance products that can help um, reduce or eliminate some of those barriers but that uh, even the insurance uh, sort of products need to make sure that 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 technology uh, uh, is is something that can be um, can be uh, be trusted and and have a track record. So with that, I hopefully didn't didn't um, misrepresent the conversation, and uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, and now it's Pat's turn if you're ready. And can you hear me? And I can see you. That's great, Pat. Okay, terrific. You're going to see me looking down at my notes, so I might take myself off video so you don't see the top of my head. Um, I want to thank our team. It was Martin Bernstein from City and Alfred Griffin um, and great help from our note taker from NACEC. So let's see, starting from the top down here, the Clean Energy Jobs Fund, we thought jobs training and R&D both need a huge investment. We don't have anywhere near enough of that going on. And there will be a lot of people who have been laid off of jobs who need to be retrained, and this would be a great thing to retrain them in. Obviously, the Safe Harbor extension should be extended because there were so many project delays during the COVID shutdown, which might even uh, might continue or happen again. Um, one of the things we spent the most time on was a national green bank uh, that could help to fund local green banks. Uh, Alfred, who's very experienced at this, uh, mentioned that it might be interesting to figure out some innovative ways to fund this. It might be through a carbon tax. It might just be through a budget line item. Um, it would perform like a fund of funds across the states, but for and of course, each state would have public-private partnerships with those public dollars and, and local banks, and it would be um, profit-making, sort of evergreen. Um, the other idea he mentioned was that for cross-state huge infrastructure projects, such as transmission or infrastructure, uh, these might be directly funded by that fund of funds that's a federal bank. Uh, we should include some kind of green insurance function into the capital stack 
um, so that these projects don't carry as much risk as they might carry now. Uh, what else is here? Um, cash grants we talked about, direct cash grants, which was the original program for funding renewables. That seemed to be a simpler, more direct program with far less legal fees. Um, it's a more efficient way to deploy cash or to deploy government uh, funding. And it's necessary now because there might be less of a tax equity appetite. So I think those are the things we discussed. And of course, the most important thing that we can't solve um, is how to get this implemented. What do we need to do as far as lobbying goes? I did mention that I'm trying to get all of my friends with college students coming back and no job opportunities to go work for uh, potential uh, people running for Congress or Senate so that we can keep the House and flip the Senate. That's really important. And that we should perhaps focus on getting jobs in Kentucky so Mitch McConnell will pay attention to us. We have to face the facts. We have to, we have to do what needs to be done. Great thoughts, Pat. Thank you. Maybe we need to use TikTok as well. Yeah, that would help. <laughs> All right. Um, Rob, your turn. Uh, two minutes, please. And, and can everyone who's not speaking keep, their, uh, keep themselves on mute? But I think we're doing well on that front. Thanks. Over to you, Rob. Uh, I'd like to thank Chris uh, from the, our NECC intern and note taker. I uh, had a great group as well. Will Sibia from our earlier panel, as well as uh, Josh Paradise and Jim Lagurfo. And, um, and I'm sorry, I forgot uh, Andrew's last name um, from BCI. Uh, the, anyway, our big thing that we came across from in, bringing innovative clean tech and really accelerating in scale, um, we've all talked about federal issues, but it, even at a regional level, uh, the difference between New York versus you know, Boston or versus Massachusetts operating in the different parts of the Northeast, even using whether it's Reggie or some other um, regional affiliations and groups to start to bring some, some more consistency to the region uh, from a regulatory standpoint. Um, the, one of the other things was obviously on the finance side, we, we thought that the capital is really there for mature technologies um, but that New York is a, a laggard maybe for some of its other peers for say wind or solar um, so that perhaps new sticks would seem to be a lot more uh, appropriate um, for moving innovation. Local Law 97 was brought up as bringing in some, some innovation uh, and Will's contributions were really helpful from a, uh, you know, bringing up the standards of what's there. He mentioned ASHRAE and building codes uh, for the Nordics where they are compared to uh, even in New York and, and what, what could be done there. So, so bringing in that, um, that to sort of uh, moving up small bore regulations that can make, make a big difference, uh, we, we thought could happen and doing that on a more consistent uh, basis. Uh, insurance was another thing that came up as a, as a barrier, uh, almost kind of the twin side of regulation, um, which was really just that uh, it's not going to be um, a is, is a challenge even for projects that are at scale or, or some of the things that have slowed down innovation uh, was the insurance side of things. So ways to address that either from a regulatory or other, other barriers that exist. Um, and it looks like we're switching over to group five. So uh, happy to turn that, off, turn that over to Cassandra, I assume. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, sorry to cut you off, but we need to wow. keep moving. Uh, so welcome, Cassandra, please. Uh, Tell us how your group went. <clears throat> sure. Um, I think, Rob, you stole my 15 seconds, so I'm going to be at 1.45 and keep this going. Um, so I, I would point out we had a summary. If we could uh, flip to the summary side, we identified four areas where um, it was ongoing tech and operation risk is something that creates a barrier um, because it's not just putting the technology in, but you have to now operate it and an infrastructure for a long time. So being able to manage what that risk is, especially with newer technologies, makes it difficult to get the appropriate financing or capital in the space that makes the cost reasonable. Um, insurance was seen as a potential solution, but the thing to keep in mind is that insurance shifts risk. So it takes it away from one group, and that's really on the tech side or consulting side, and it shifts it to 
the financial sector, which should be able to bear it. But again, I think this was pointed out in an earlier slide, um, for earlier stage technologies, you still necessarily won't get insurance in there because you still have to prove out an earlier stage technology. So it's most useful when it's closer to the commercialization stage. Um, the next thing is that time has a particular impact on um, technology obsolescence versus capital. So if it takes a very, very long time to get a project done, by time it should be ready to operate. Uh, it's now an obsolete technology. So the real question is, do you get the right capital in there to do so? Or do you pretty much say, I just don't wanna do it. Um, and then the last point, um, which I don't think it made it here, but I thought it was really important, um, was lack of early collaboration um, between um, stakeholders. Uh, on our panel, we had a really great panel. Um, it was David from Lexton, uh, Will from, I'm sorry, I lost my, my notes from my panel. Everyone was great. Um, is uh, actually Michael from the Heinz Group, Russ from the North River Capital, and David uh, from Lexton. And what was really great is that all of them spoke about collaboration. So lack of collaboration, particularly early on, makes one more expensive to do a project, but it makes it difficult to get you to work through it operationally and to structure things in advance in a way that works for all stakeholders. Um, so those are, I think we saw as our four primary barriers, but you know, capital is there and wants to, if we can get past those barriers. Fantastic, Cassandra, well done. And very quickly, Stacy. Hi, yes. Um, hopefully the last uh, but best group over here. Um, so we had a great group. We talked about a few things. Number one, longevity. Longevity from a stimulus standpoint is really important when it comes to creating space for projects with tax credits, uh, tax breaks, making sure that developers or anyone who's actually really initiating in a project feels like there is some longevity. Uh, what we talked a lot about was alleviating that start and stop mentality. Um, that being said, we did talk a lot about what it meant from a federal standpoint, from a state uh, standpoint, and also from a city standpoint. And really, uh, we talked a lot about how crossing state lines is actually really difficult. Uh, jurisdictions have very different understandings and thoughts and even leadership that that differs, um, you know, between two or three miles across the border. So the one thing that we talked a lot about was rethinking the dynamic between public and private um, financing and how can we start doing that when it comes to this uh, understanding of the stimulus um, also uh, extending the ppp application even though ppe is very important these days but uh, the ppp application is set to expire on june 30th and currently there's about another hundred million dollars uh, ready to deploy so we have to make sure that our small businesses and people in need of that ppp money can get that money into their hands um, and then really the other part was task force uh, we talked about being agile being agile to uh, quickly green light projects to move forward george uh, who was on our panel earlier talked a lot about that and I think that's a really key component to make sure that projects can be put in front of a committee or a task force, understand the risk and be able to deploy it quickly, uh, the quote unquote shovel ready projects uh, to help push some of these items forward. So thank you very much for my team. That's it. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you to all the facilitators for doing such a great job and thank you to the note takers who helped them. And uh, clearly thanks to the audience for participating so, uh, so engagingly. All right, let's um, Move over now to the final session. Uh, I'd like to reintroduce Peter, but also um, Alfred Griffin, president of the New York Green Bank. Looking forward to your reflections and some updates from Alfred. So over to you, Peter. Uh, I'm going to stop Thank sharing. You. Just have a video. Great. Thank you very much, Alistair, and everybody. Great discussion to hear from all of the the uh, the different breakout groups. And really interested to do this wrap up. This. Uh, I, I'm very happy to have Alfred Griffin here with me and with us. Um, Alfred, Alfred is the president of the New York Green Bank. Um, he is an industry leader in developing innovative solutions in support of the financing of renewable energy generation and energy efficiency projects. Um, Alistair, I think you have frozen, but I'm, not, I'm assuming others are hearing or seeing me. I hear you loud and clear, Peter. Okay, you, good. Uh, yeah. You're, you're moving around, so. Okay, okay thanks. No, it, it would look a little strange when the other part of the screen had frozen, but there you are, Alfred. Um, so it, Alfred, very briefly, it is the president at the New York Green Bank, uh, which is focused on partnerships with the private sector and private capital providers and energy market participants to help address barriers that limit private investment into renewable energy and, and other aspects of clean energy. 
Uh, Alfred has a background in structured finance uh, in a, with a number of different institutions, including at Citigroup, uh, and has played roles which have included developing first-of-kind deal structures, which is exactly an area of expertise that is core to a function of the Green Bank. And I think I've heard it come up at least half a dozen times in the last few minutes. So Alfred, uh, thanks for being here. And I know you've been listening in and as well as collaborating in this, these breakouts for, for much of these sessions. Would love to hear what sort of thoughts, what sort of takeaways you, you've been thinking about as, as you've listened in and been reflecting on all this. Yeah, well, thank, thank you, Peter and, and Alistair for, and the NECC team for organizing this great um, Zoom webinar and, and good afternoon to all the, um, all the participants. Yeah, so I've, I've found it to be a, a very interesting um, few hours. And, um, you know, starting with uh, Jeff and Alicia and the Financial Innovation Panel, um, you know, great, of course, to hear about Hannon. Um, I'm, I've known Hannon for a long time and Jeff's team and um, in terms of all they've done in an innovative way. And, and then, of course, Alicia articulated um, the state objectives and our plan for getting there. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, Hannon, uh, you know, Jeff's comment that states have been the most effective policymakers is something that we often talk about in New York um, in terms of the states uh, being the, the laboratories of democracy. I certainly think we've seen that. Um, I was uh, really impressed to hear that, and I probably should have known it already, but that Hannon's been investing over a billion dollars per year. Uh, that certainly uh, indicates that we have the ability for focused investors to be able to invest at scale. And of course, you know, I've, I've heard Jeff uh, reference carbon count in the past in terms of that, you know, there's a long list of transactions that reduce greenhouse gases, but you know, shouldn't we be most focused on those that have the greatest impact? Uh, I was super excited to hear that, um, you know, both view the electrification of buildings through heat pumps and so forth to be an enormous important market that's scalable. And of course, transportation, that's an area we have to resolve and will be electrified as well. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, Jeff had, uh, had wrapped up, um, you know, thinking, you know, that, that you got to have a carbon tax and dividend program is, the, is really the way to get there. Um, you know, and that'll, that'll drive transportation, buildings, and agriculture to be more carbon free. Um, his uh, comment that we're, we're actually seeing the cost of capital for fossil fuels go up and for clean energy related transactions and companies go down. And as this gap widens, we'll see an acceleration of that, and and um, and that that is at the end of the day what will really drive drive markets. Um, and I thought Jeff's comments in terms of you know integration being critical, whole building, whole utility system integration will drive the change really really needed. So those were some of my uh, takeaway thoughts. Uh, Peter, what what did I miss from your perspective? Um, I think you got a lot of really important ones. I think I also heard about. Uh, a fair amount, yeah, I think in the middle panel, the middle section about um, starting looking at insurance, looking at different ways of packaging financial products um, and getting technology through stages of development where you can clarify the risk and develop those new products, whether they are structured more like insurance or something else. Um, but I think that's an area for really important work uh, and I think relevant to the kind of stuff that you're doing with the Green Bank and many others who are, are here are involved in that too. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And yeah, that, that second panel um, in, in terms of with Ravina and David and Will and George that Alistair hosted, yeah, I think mm -hmm. that, is a, that is a theme that was pretty, yeah. pretty consistent. Um, you know, how do you, also, do, new, yeah. how do you deal with new technologies? And we certainly heard that, I think, among at least three of the, it came up in our breakout, and I think at least two other breakouts, sort of coming back to how do you, uh, how do you find the party best able to understand that risk and, uh, and underwrite it? And I do think um, that the panelist, um, I think on the last panel that spoke, she, you know, pointed out, well, you know, you're just allocating the risk to someone. So, um, whether it's an insurance company or rather than a bank or what have you underwriting that risk that, um, you know, somebody's got to take the risk and they're probably not in the business of taking venture capital kind of risks. But 
and I think she's exactly right. I think it's a really important point, but, but at the same time on the margin, I do think um, some of the insurance companies have, you know, deep inherent expertise in some of these technologies that, that perhaps, um, you know, the banks don't. And, um, right. and, and for those areas where it's, where it can't, it is proven, but maybe not to the extent that a bank would be comfortable with, the insurance companies can take on some of that risk. And certainly there's a role for government to play there potentially. And we've, we've seen the Department of Energy, for example, play an important role in that regard in the past, where they do have deep expertise in some of these technologies and, and a, a balance sheet. Yeah, absolutely. I think that I think that's a great point. Um, I think we also had a number of discussions that looked at uh, the public private partnership side of things, how public sector and private sector roles and capital come together. And, and the flip side of that was that it wasn't just around individual technologies. Many of the examples are more complicated integrated systems at the at the building or district or campus scale, sometimes multiple resource systems. Um, and that that's that that is the broader operating or or resources as a service kind of uh, opportunity that a lot of these uh, sectors are evolving to that would that would really allow for scale um, at both at both in the scale of the of individual projects and the scale of markets around those kinds of projects so I think that's exciting stuff and, and Alfred, I think I wanted to switch this up a little bit and ask you a question on a different side for a sec. Uh, although I think it's responsive to everything we've been talking about today, because the New York Green Bank, I think, has just finished up a, a report looking at, you know, reflecting on the last couple of years, but also updating your, your business plan and strategy. Um, and we'd love to ask you to take a couple of minutes and, and share what's new, what, what's going to be, what's, what's the updated, either reinforced focus, but also additional areas of focus that are, that's part of your plan going forward. Well, th thank you. We, we do every June 19th, we are um, required by the Public Services Commission to file a business review and business plan. And our fiscal year ends in March of each year. And so it's an opportunity to reflect and to set forth goals going forward. And then we are expected to report upon how we did against those goals and milestones. So we do all this in a very public fashion. And if anyone's interested in seeing it, um, if you go to our website um, and under a resources tab, there's a, um, a uh, petition or a public, um, I can't even remember exactly what it said, public filings tab. And under that, we do a lot of financial reporting and our business plans and our quarterly metrics reports. So just go there and you'll see our 2020 business plan. A couple of highlights, I'll spend most of the time on looking forward, but a couple of quick highlights. We noted there that, um, just prior to filing that we, we crossed the billion dollar threshold in terms of investments by New York Green Bank since inception, which is um, a big milestone for us. Um, we, we're a billion dollar green bank and we've invested a billion dollars now. Um, good news is we're not out of capital because over half of our investments have been refinanced. So we still have 500 million approximately of, of dry powder to, to do more. Um, we closed 14 transactions last year, invested $222 million last year. Um, our projects to date in terms of our billion dollars has supported about $2.6 in total projects. We added some important team members, including one who's participating in this webinar, Lindsay uh, Drogan, who is uh, 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 delighted to have on board. And we've continued, continued to be self-sufficient. Um, you know, looking forward, um, we, um, you know, we, 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 in terms of things beyond uh, business as usual, um, we, we do have a real focus on COVID, um, pause, restart, economic recovery. You know, I think one of the most important things we can do in that regard is be who we are, which is we are a 100% dedicated, sustainable infrastructure credit fund in effect. We only do one thing. We're not looking at we're not saying, oh, well, it looks like oil and gas bonds are really cheap now, so we're going to run over there and invest in those. Um, you know, we have we have one one focus. Um, you know, so I think some of our counterparts out in the market, some of them do have to look at alternative assets and sort of move across sectors, and 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 that has happened and reduced some participation in these markets. But we are focused. We continue to execute term sheets. We're not distracted. 
And we've been quite busy, which is a great sign for the markets, is a great sign for New York, and I assume there are probably consistencies there in, in other states. We've, um, we've done a market survey in terms of how we can be most impact impactful from a COVID-related standpoint, and we're developing products in that regard. We were recently, we've, we've been in the, in the queue for quite a while, but just in the last couple of weeks, we've been approved as a PPP lender under the SBA program. And um, you know, assuming that the PPP program is extended beyond June 30th, we will start making loans for those parties that um, are in the, uh, in the business of reducing uh, greenhouse gases and have a New York State nexus. Um, and if there are any that have not participated in that program, we will be providing financing. Um, you know, we'll continue to build our pipeline and our portfolio. We expect to see a lot more activity with large scale renewables where there's not been, there've been a lot of awardees of um, renewable energy credits, but not a lot built in the last couple of years. But um, the governor and, and, and the state um, put in place a new permitting process that we expect to see some of those projects come on board. Seek community distributed generation remains very active. There's been a lot of groundwork laid around storage the last uh, couple of years in terms of uh, policy and regulatory frameworks. And we're starting to see the percolation of market activity in that regard, um, which is great to see. I mean, we're seeing real, real storage transactions showing up now. Um, buildings and clean transportation obviously remain a big focus as well. Um, and we expect to see a lot more, more policy and uh, frameworks on the transportation front. Um, one area that's a that's always been an important area to us, but we have a very significant strategic initiative around disadvantaged and LMI communities. You know, 42 percent of New York State's population lives in LMI census areas. Um, CLCPA that took effect January 2020 mandates that disadvantaged communities receive at least 35 percent of overall benefits of climate programs in the state. And we are determined to make certain that we are delivering in that regard. Uh, we've been working with a market leading consultant um, for the last few months to help us map out our stra strategies and approaches um, that we will, be, um, we will be rolling out in the coming uh, months. And we're, we're very excited about, about this. Um, the last point I will make is that um, we also uh, noted in the, in the business plan that we expect to do a secondary market financing of our portfolio via a debt financing. Um, that, that will allow us to do more per dollar of ratepayer capital. And there's gonna be a lot more to be done. We've been really busy the last few years, but with CLCPA and the various programs that are rolling out, um, there's going to be a lot more need for capital and we you know we want to be certain that we're clear we send clear signals to the market that if they work with us on these long lead time transactions that not only do we have capital today but we will also have capital to execute in the future and and having a, having this uh, financing facility in place will help us send that signal so those are um, some of the broad strokes of what we talk about in our business plan that's great, and, and Alfred, thank you for sharing that. It, it's uh, inspiring to see the full range of sectors and roles, so some of it specific to certain technology, some of it more infrastructure related to the sector and the technology, some of it addressing certain communities and, and customer segments. Uh, all of those differences, I think, is really important to the mission and, and important to the task of scaling clean energy and the transition to a clean economy. So thank you for sharing that. And I, and I think we will, as part of a follow-up to this event, I think we can share a link to the, your, your business plan document, uh, sure. the location on the site. And um, I found it very interesting. I skimmed it a little bit the other night and it's, uh, there's more to take in there. So it's very uh, nice. A lot there. We put, we yeah. put, we put it, we put it all, all out there for folks to see the, the things we, we did accomplish and the things we didn't accomplish. Uh, that, that that was very noticeable. So thank you very much. And I know as this was a short wrap up. Um, again, this is one of those conversations that I, I look forward to continuing through some venue, but great to have you here uh, participating throughout this and then sharing your reflections on, on the day and where we are in, in development of financial solutions, financial innovation 
to deal with clean energy and clean tech innovation and market. So it's very valuable to have this. And, and with that, I'm going to welcome Alistair back into this um, as we're wrapping up. Um, we have, I want to make sure everyone who's here with us knows we've got, we, NECC continues to have events, continues to do a number of things. They are all virtual at this point uh, for the, for at least for the near term. Um, so you can see there are several events coming up, a Massachusetts Clean Energy Day event next week, which has a public speaking portion to it. Pathways to Net Zero, this is the first part of this series, which is focused uh, in large ways on, on electrification and innovation in buildings. Uh, that's on July 9th. We are planning a hydrogen summit. Uh, we don't have a date yet. We'll watch for an announcement in July for the fall. And then the Cleantech Open Northeast Regional Finals, the, the accelerator, startup accelerator that NECEC runs uh, is, being, is scheduled for October 1st and 2nd, and more details will be coming on that. Uh, the other bullet that's here is about an event that is not coming up. Um, but, a, but an alternative program. Uh, the Green Tie Gala, which is our largest event of the year, historically has been for many years. We've canceled that this year. Um, we just announced that yesterday, which is why we're mentioning it here. It normally brings in four to 500 people. Um, that is not appropriate in this, uh, this year. Uh, so we are canceling it, but we are looking at uh, opportunities to do, do something more focused on clean energy, getting back to work. Um, so we'll be sharing that in the next couple of weeks. Also, let me turn it back to you to for finals for final uh, wrap up. Thank you, Peter. Well, it's been a fascinating couple of hours, two and a half hours, I think. Uh, some really interesting discussions. I want to say a big thank you to the speakers, uh, but also to everyone who made this work uh, smoothly, which is uh, the facilitators, the note takers, and our backup team: uh, Sean, Kate, uh, Trisha, and Mary Elizabeth. So. Um, I don't want to keep you any longer, but it's been a great experience. Thank you so much for participating. We'll be writing up a blog uh, with the help from some of our interns and, uh, and sharing a report as well. And this was recorded. Please share it with your friends on LinkedIn or wherever afterwards and um, spread the word so that we can continue to accelerate the deployment of clean energy. Thank you. Bye now. Enjoy your lunch. <laughs> Thank you, Alistair and Peter. Thank you very much, Alfred. <clears throat> Thanks, Alfred.